everybody. Thank you for joining our podcast, Voices of Customer Experience. I'm your host, Crystal Garrett, and today our special guest is Peter Fader. He's a professor of marketing at the Wharton School of University of Penn and the author of Customer Centricity. His expertise centers around analysis of behavioral data to understand and forecast customer shopping and purchasing activities. Peter's worked with a wide range of industries, and he's the co-founder of a predictive analytics firm called Zodiac, which was founded in 2015, and it was sold to Nike in 2018. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. We are extremely excited to have you. It's my pleasure to chat with you guys. And also, I want to thank my co-host, Worthix CEO, Guillermo Secura. We call him Guy for short. So, Guy, thank you so much for co-hosting with me today. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's a, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to Peter, especially because I'm a big fan. And, and I had the chance to read his book for like the second or third time this week. Okay. Awesome. Well, I, I, won't, I won't hesitate to cold call you, Guy. <laughs> that sounds good. So, Peter, let's start with a topic that's polemic. Of course, like Guy said, we've read and read your books and thoroughly enjoyed them. And I actually took a course with you some years ago. Um, and one thing that really stood out to us was that you said every customer deserves the same respect, but not the same attention. We find that very interesting. Um, they're not equal. So based on your definition of customer centricity, you know, targeting that right customer at the right time to get those right results, could you please share with us more of your thoughts on this? I sure can. Yeah, you know, I, I have to admit, uh, and look, looking back at, at the book and, and the ideas and all the experience I've had since then, uh, customer centricity is, is actually a really bad choice of words because too many people get the impression that it means that we're centered around the customer, that whoever you are, whatever it is that you want, we are there for you. You are at the center of our attention and activity. And that's not really what I'm talking about. Uh, what I'm really talking about is that there are certain customers that we choose to be centered around. There are certain customers who are so incredibly valuable to us that they represent the growth engine in a way that, let's say, innovation or efficiency or the usual business practices can't achieve. But if we can figure out who the best customers are and find ways to enhance their value and extract some of that value and find more customers like them, that we can achieve growth that we can't by just focusing on the products. So it's really a question not of focusing on you know, the customer and what we're going to do for, for them, but which customers do we want to be centered around. So it's an important point of clarification. And in the kind of classic example, like the Nordstrom one, uh, and it's very different for that company and many other companies now, but it was, you know, we don't really care who you are. We're going to delight you. We're going to make it worthwhile for you, even if you're completely worthless to us. That's the concern that I have. Yeah, I, and, and I totally agree with that because basically you're putting like a big machine without a focus to operate and try to get to deliver the best for someone that, that this machine is not aware about the existence. So, so it, it gets tricky, right? So how are you going to perform your best if you don't know for who you're performing to? Exactly right. And, and it's more than that. I mean, that, that is the heart of it. But then there's all these spillover effects. Um, when we want to evaluate the efforts that we're doing, how do we do that without knowing what the value of the customers would have been in the absence of those activities and campaigns? So we also need to do customer evaluation, even if nothing else, just to get the baseline so that we can do the kind of ROI analysis on our CX campaign or something like that. So we really need the, the customer evaluation both to, to, to drive the decisions that we're going to make as well as to assess their effectiveness. So I, I guess that the, the end of the, like the, the biggest goal here is to make sure, and, and I see this a lot as a startup. Uh, is to build and increase your customer lifetime value. And you talk a, a lot about this with, with your book. And there's one thing that I noticed that in the past, and, and even today, there's still a lot of companies out there that they're focused on creating more transactions and bringing in as many customers as possible without being that much concerned on keeping them loyal. And they understand that to keep them loyal, they have to, whatever, uh, give them gifts or, or do things that are not necessarily related to their expectations to keep them loyal. And, and uh, so basically the old model was more focused on transactions. And what we see today, at least as a startups, is that we are more concerned on keeping customers for longer by making sure that we have the right customers. Actually, whenever a startup is trying to raise money nowadays, 
even the investors, they ask us about our ratio between our customer acquisition costs and our and the lifetime value uh, we have like in, in our uh, in our in our business. So so basically that that reminds me of another topic that you that you talk about a lot, which is uh, customer equity. So for startups, for example, customer equity is like a key thing if you want to actually grow your business and, and make it last for long enough. Uh, what can you tell us a lot about like customer lifetime value and customer equity? Yep. So we got the good news and the bad news. The good news, as you said, is that CLV is now part of the kind of working vocabulary of of not only uh, startups but but uh, but retailers and and you know, pretty much any uh, any customer facing company any company that has direct relationship with its customers everybody's talking about lifetime value whether we're calling it CLV or LTV or, or other kinds of alphabet soup I have a Google alert on lifetime value and it's amazing uh, how many more uh, kind of links come up every single day than than even just a year ago. So that's the good news is everybody's talking about it. Everyone kind of gets the basic concept. As you said, VCs are starting to hold their portfolio companies somewhat accountable by looking at the CLV to CAC ratio. Uh, and that's where the bad news kicks in is that for a lot of these portfolio companies, it starts becoming a box to be checked. And yeah, 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 we're doing the CLV thing. Sure, sure, sure. Leave us alone. Get off our backs. We're, we're, we're doing the CLV. And, and here's our number. Uh, and the problem is, that the, the, the rigor, the validity, the accountability for uh, the lifetime value calculations is actually really, really poor. Uh, most companies, and I, and I really do mean this, most companies that are talking about it, to the extent that they're putting numbers up against it at all, are basically making things up. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not doing the calculations the right way. They're not being transparent about how it's, uh, how it's being done. They're not coming up with kind of apples to apples comparisons across different cohorts of customers or periods of time. Um, and of course, the VCs and the other investors aren't doing a good job to hold them accountable. So, uh, so, uh, so again, I'm delighted to see the conversation taking place. I'm concerned that the calculations aren't, uh, aren't de being done well or being done in a standardized way. And I'm super worried that because at this point it's all cheap talk, that a lot of the customer valuation stuff could kind of collapse under its own weight. Um, so I think it's really, really, really important to get it right um, if we're really going to be using it to make these kinds of decisions. And what would you recommend for, let's say, startups or even big companies? What should they do to make sure that they're doing the right calculation? So what is this best practice that you consider? Boy, I love that softball question, Guy. I love it. Because, of course, of figuring out how to calculate lifetime value is what I've been doing for 30 years here at the Wharton School. Uh, so, so it turns out, the, 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 again, good news, bad news. The good news is that the methods are now really, really well established. Uh, a, a part of it is the academic work, and part of it, I'm not sure if you and the listeners are aware, but I actually started up a predictive analytics firm called Zodiac, that was actually doing this with a variety of companies from lots of different sectors. And we were doing it rigorously and we were doing it regularly and we were doing it transparently and accountably. Um, and it was awesome fun to see the research come to life and to see companies making good decisions. And again, um, uh, standing by the numbers. And then just uh, two months ago, uh, Nike uh, bought the company. So on, on one hand, that's fabulous that uh, that that a that a big brand oriented company like Nike would would see the value in all this this customer valuation customer equity and buy it up uh, but it also has now kind of you know tied my hands a bit now it now belongs to them not me um, and, and and can't spread the gospel quite as broadly as before but it was i think in some ways a watershed moment to show the importance of doing these calculations the right way and the willingness of, of big firms to, to make that kind of investment. So based on what you just shared, 
them not calculating the correct way and underestimating the, the customer's potential. What do you think about traditional metrics? And what do you think companies like you see companies like Toys R Us dying and, and their metrics are great, but yeah. they're gone. So what do you what do you think about traditional metrics and what needs to change? I love it. I love it. I love it. No, that's su- such a, a perfect question. So <laughs> it's almost as if we set all this up. So the big uh, kind of um, a change that I made, the new challenge now that we've sold Zodiac to, to Nike, is to have this laser focus on customer-based corporate valuation. That Let's first start with the concept that if we can wave our magic wand and come up with the value of each and every customer and add all that up, then that should give us the value of all the operating assets for the firm. You know, every dollar we make is going to arise through the customer or the customers. Uh, so let's uh, let's project see let's project how many customers are going to acquire, how long are they going to stay, how many transactions are they going to make, how much are they going to spend. Let's calculate all those things. Let's project them forward. Let's discount it back. Let's do all the accounting stuff and say this is what the company's worth. So we're doing this very very serious very seriously now. I have a new startup called Theta Equity Partners equity.com and, and we're doing this, working with a variety of companies as well as private equity firms, VCs, hedge funds, uh, to basically do this kind of bottom-up corporate valuation. And this gets right to the heart of your question, uh, Crystal, which is if you're an investor in, in a consumer-facing company and they're not going to give you all the transaction log data and you probably don't even want it, they're just going to give you a handful of metrics. Every quarter, they're going to give you two or three metrics. What are those metrics that you want to see that are actually going to be truly indicative, not just nice to know, not just pretty on a dashboard, but are going to be truly indicative of the customer equity and the overall corporate valuation? So with a former PhD student of mine, Dan McCarthy, who is a co-founder in this data equity firm, this was his dissertation, was to take this idea and do it for real. Let's evaluate the goodness of different kinds of rolled up metrics to figure out which ones really are predictive and diagnostic and which ones are merely nice to know. And then uh, find companies that release these metrics and then do this valuation on them or for them to show what they're really worth. You're listening to Voices of Customer Experience. If you want more CX content, visit us at worthix.com to download one of our customer experience ebooks, subscribe to our blog, and get our newsletter on the future of CX delivered to your inbox. Since you mentioned worth, most of the time I tell uh, our clients at least is like more important than having the most satisfied customers on earth you should be make, making sure that most of the time you are the most worth it alternative uh, while you're addressing your customer needs. So I guess that the, the worthiness uh, for a business uh, and their customer's perceptions of worthiness is more important than whatever other metric you're, ha- you're measuring, right? Because that actually represents the balance between you know, the overall analysis that a customer is actually doing when, when he's about to make a decision and choose uh, w- w- to which company he's going to give his money to in order to get access to the benefits that he's looking for to, that will address his expectation needs and everything. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes, yes. So let's let's kind of take a step back here cause, uh, to kind of put put that that great point in historical context. So look, for for years and years, we've been pushing this customer evaluation idea, and a lot of companies were kind of skeptical about it. It seemed a little bit too technical. It seemed, you know, it's all based on a forecast, so it could be wrong. So there was a lot of, of skepticism, I think unfounded, but a lot of people who weren't willing to kind of place their bets based on a projection of what each customer is going to be worth. But the satisfaction metrics, in particular net promoter score, but, but many others like it, really caught people's attention. Uh, and and let's, let's give it credit that it actually, for the first time, created a C-level conversation about a customer metric and about how the customers differ from each other, the promoters versus the, tr- the detractors and so on. So it actually did a great job. Let's give Frederick Reichheld and Bain Consulting a, just a, a hat tip for saying, you know what, you pushed us in the right direction. And now that companies get it, now that companies see the importance of, of understanding the, their relationships with each and every customer, and how, uh, now let's try to put some, some meat on those bones. And so it's not in any way to criticize a satisfaction metric. I think there still is a role for it, but in, but 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 its main role is just kind of an on-ramp 
to then get into kind of, like I said, the meaty ones, and that would be customer lifetime value. And looking at the interplay of kind of an attitudinal metric like satisfaction and a behavioral financial metric like CLV, the good news is that they do kind of line up fairly well together, uh, but, but the CLV metrics are going to be far more predictive and, again, far more precise and accountable. So let's start to transition or augment our uh, satisfaction metrics with our, 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 our hardcore CLV ones. I totally agree. One thing that, that I also like to uh, say and, and think of is like whenever you're using, and I agree with you, like NPS and, and CSAT, they're super important. They, and especially NPS, it was super important at the time that they, they became like accessible for most companies to, to build the culture, to actually to provoke C-level people to think about the customer. And I totally agree with that. But I see like that this metrics are like uh, really uh, more focused on measuring the emotions that customers have with the current value proposition, with uh, but but not necessarily measuring if the current value proposition it's it's up to date. If it if the current value proposition is the thing that it's is the thing that the customer wants as of today, right? So I guess I, I totally agree. Like by adding other other dimensions or or other key elements to the process and combining them. You're going to be able to probably get more value or, or, or better predictable power by using lifetime value than to use, just to say, like emo some sort of emotional metric. That is my take on it. And again, that's not in any way to say that, that the emotional metrics, that the uh, that, that attitudes uh, that, that have, have no value at all, uh, they can actually do a fantastic job of helping to understand the CLV differences. So we do our kind of hardcore financial one, looking at the boring transaction logs, and we say, hey, here's the, the great customers, here's the, the good ones, here's the so-so, here's the bad. Now let's bring in all those other metrics to try to understand how those groups are different from each other. So what is it that makes them tick? What kinds of products do they want? What's the best way to reach them? So I'm not throwing out all the, those, those other measures. Uh, I'm just putting them in their right context to be able to, to have them shine instead of having them kind of uh, uh, try to do a job that they're not really capable of doing. Exactly. It's like putting the right responsibility in the right metric for the right thing. That is right, right, right. Perfect. So it's, it's been a while that, that you wrote your book, like, like six years, and the market has been changing like so fast. Uh, what has changed in your vision since, since you, you updated or, or, or wrote your book? Okay, so I'm going to talk about changes both ways. Changes I've seen in the marketplace as well as changes in kind of my own perspective. Uh, so, so we've already discussed one of the changes in the marketplace, which is just much greater acceptance of the idea of customer valuation, much greater acceptance of the idea that not all customers are created equal and that those differences across them can not, not only be nice to know, but can be really valuable to driving the business. Um, uh, so, so this, this overall conversation that we've been having today is much more, um, say, rule than exception compared to where it was uh, six, seven years ago. And even the companies that I criticized in my book, you mentioned Nordstrom earlier, but even companies like Starbucks and Walmart and, and I, I can't even remember who else, uh, companies I used to be very critical about um, are, have, have made such great strides. Uh, and I'm not even going to take credit for it. I think it's just them waking up and, and, and seeing b both the opportunity and this, the necessity. So the world has changed quite a lot over those five, six years. So that that's great. That's fantastic. And I'd like to believe that I played a, a little tiny role in, in making some of that happen. But I've changed too. Uh, and, and it used to be, and, and in fact, you might get the impression from this conversation so far that, uh, well, you know what, we wave our magic wand, we calculate the CLVs, and then great things happen. It's kind of as easy as that. And it turns out that it's not as easy as that. And it turns out that uh, you can't start with the metrics and the quant stuff and, and all the things they've been talking about. I'm talking about that stuff because that's my bread and butter. It's the stuff I enjoy. The stuff that I'm, I'm not as comfortable with, but is actually more important, would be things like corporate culture organizational design, uh, you know, just the, the way that you communicate about customer-centric strategies uh, within the organization. So a lot of that soft stuff, the stuff that's harder to measure, hard to manage, if you don't get that right, 
And if you don't get that right before you start this pivot towards customer centricity, it's probably not going to work. And there are so many companies that will read my book and will, you know, say, this is great. Let's try it. Let's do the CLV thing. Let's get the magic wand. Uh, and, they, and they don't manage to get full traction across the company because it's, it's harder for them to get that, that, that buy-in and, again, the, the, the right cultural fit. So the key is to kind of start higher in the organization, but with this kind of broader, almost softer conversation uh, to get people to say, okay, I see where we're going. How do we get there? Instead of getting the, the cart before the horse, which sometimes I'm, I'm guilty about. So it's been a, a, a real interesting change for me, and I have a much greater appreciation of, of practices and skills that I, I have to admit I still haven't even mastered yet. To hear more from Peter Fader, you can follow him on Twitter at FaderP or find him on LinkedIn. Peter's book, Customer Centricity, can be found on Amazon. And please keep an eye out for his new book, Customer Centricity Playbook. One thing that you said that it's very interesting, um, in my opinion, is that in the end, it's all about people. So when we're talking about customers, we are talking about individuals and, and uniqueness. And when you're talking about companies, uh, again, we are talking about people. So what are companies, right? Companies, they're basically a group of people trying to convince another group of people or individuals to do business with them to get some, some sort of value in an exchange, uh, give them some, some coins, some money, right? So you're, you're right. So just, just by having the top leaders in an organization with the, with the right mindset wouldn't, wouldn't make any sort of change unless the entire organization is actually with the same mindset. And, and, and I, I, on my perception nowadays, like the mindset is the most important thing because that's what actually can make like a, a tiny company sometimes with 50 employees be much, much faster and, and a lot more successful than a company that sometimes has 5,000 employees simply because of the mindset and the, their ability of speeding up and implementing their ideas and addressing everything that, it's, that actually mattered to those unique customers that they mapped and identified, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, you're so right. And it's so, you, now that you say that, it sounds so obvious in hindsight, like, duh, what was they thinking? Yeah, not only are customers people, but we got to get the employees on board. Uh, so, you know, it, it, I'm sometimes a little thick, thick-headed. Um, so it was uh, better late than never. And like I said, it, it, it'll be a really interesting to see the, the winners emerging, not because they necessarily can calculate CLV faster or better, uh, but because, they, uh, because they, they know how to create the right environment uh, where, where even if you're using slightly suboptimal models or whatever, uh, but at least it can flourish. Right. That's that's great, Peter. And just to kind of um, piggyback on what Guy just said, it does come down to the customer. And one thing that you, one thing that you said was that the first step to customer centricity is to start with the CRM, you know, to, to try and get one on one with the customer. It's, it's the, you know, the Wonderman approach. And I loved how you you use Natasha Salon as an example, because there's something special about um, being in that chair, you know, and they know your family, they know what your needs are, they, they become almost like a confidant for you. And so you keep going back. And I think that's something that's missing. So my in closing, one thing I want to ask you is, what would you tell companies today on how to accomplish that, um, I guess, experience or that connection with their customer? Uh, yeah, so that's what it's all about, right? So, so part of it, is is being better at tagging and tracking so that's that's crm so so understand who's buying what when and then to the hair salon example that you were just referring to for folks who aren't familiar with the book i talk about what happens in in a setting like that where you where your you know your hairstylist or whomever isn't only writing down you know when you came in and, and what you spent but just knowing everything about your kind of your family your hopes and dreams and wants and needs and aspirations right. and and finding ways to kind of add value, not just giving you discounts, um, not just kind of throwing free stuff at you that you might not even need or want, um, but to find ways to be a true trusted advisor, to say that we're, we're with you kind of all the way, uh, not only as our own relationship changes, but as kind of, you know, your life changes. Uh, that's much harder to do. Um, that that's it's harder to kind of jam all of that stuff into the CRM system. 
It's hard just to mandate that to your frontline employees. But again, a company that can create an environment that makes it kind of easy and natural and, and rewarding uh, to do that kind of thing is one that's going to find success with customer centricity. Right. Um, I, I, I must tell you this. I love the simplicity of your thoughts. And, and I guess like the beauty of everything you write is related to how simple you're capable of putting your ideas and, and, and always making sure that we're focusing in the, in the most important thing, which is again, people, right? So, uh, as a final mm -hmm. question, so we can wrap up this, this, this chapter of our podcast, this episode. Um, I would, since we're talking about people, so we have a lot of people right now probably listening to this podcast. What is your, what is your message for those executives that are listening to us now? Sometimes they could be product executive, product executive. They can be C lab executive. So, uh, what's your final message for them? How they, can, what, what is the, the thing that they can do tomorrow to be able to keep up with the speed of change? Sure. So, all right. So I'll give you three super quick points. Uh, number one is, is recognize that, that these changes are happening. They are inevitable. Everybody uh, needs to embrace these customer-centric ideas, whether it's going to be the main focus of your business or just to kind of keep up with, with uh, to have kind of minimal uh, 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 to be at par with your competitors. So you can't, you can't put it off and just obsessing over innovation and efficiency just isn't enough anymore. So, you know, you gotta read the book and listen to a podcast like this and, and start to dip your toes in the water. That's number one. Number two, uh, is to, to run small experiments. Don't just declare victory. Don't declare change across the entire enterprise and say, we are now customer centric. You got to pick one small segment, one geographic area, one product line, one small isolated area and try it there first. There's a good chance it's going to fail, but you have to figure out how to, how, how to do the dance steps, both from a technical standpoint as well as a cultural and communication one. So start small. And number three comes back to the data. Uh, too many companies are obsessing over ca trying to capture everything. Let's build a data lake and let's capture every touch and so on. And I'm saying, once again, start small, start with simple transaction log data, squeeze as much insight as you can out of that before you start layering on all the social and the geolocation and the new row and, and all kinds of other things. There's gold in them, their hills, and you don't need to build mountains first. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very insightful. Okay, so uh, Peter, I, I really appreciate your time. It was really, really, again, insightful, everything you said, and I, I'm positive that most of of the people that are listening to our podcast you're going to be like uh, thrilled to start doing things different as of tomorrow uh, so i i truly appreciate your time and would be like a, a real pleasure to be able to ha to have you here with us again maybe in a couple of months so we can keep discussing how the market is evolving and 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 all about customer experience and how companies could address a better uh their their strategies and, and their implementations regarding customer experience. Well, thank you so much, Guy and Christo. You know, you, you guys are, are, are doing a great job to, to take some of these these conceptual ideas and making them real. Uh, and I think it's just so important is, is to build an entire ecosystem instead of just leaving it up to companies on their own to figure this stuff out. So keep up the good work, and I really do look forward to keeping the conversation going. Well, Peter, thank you so much for coming on. You have a wealth of knowledge, and our listeners will have more than enough to take away. And thanks to our listeners. Please join us next week to hear from Cisco's former chief creative, Rachel McBrarity, on the evolving practices of CX. Voices of Customer Experience is brought to you by Worthix. This podcast is produced by Crystal Garrett, Mary Drummond, and edited by Anthony Sledge. To hear more and subscribe, go to worthix.com to get more material.